From the Memorial Auditorium in Dallas, Texas, America's oldest Pentecostal church presents Forward in Faith, the radio voice of the Church of God. This worship service is a part of the 50th General Assembly of the Church of God. We have invited Dr. Charles W. Kahn, first assistant general overseer of the Church of God and chairman of our radio and television board, to pray for us. Our Father, we pray that thou wilt hear our petition unto thee, and that thou wilt bless the many who listen to this broadcast across this nation and in every nation. We pray, O oh God, that thou wilt bless that each need may be met by thy spirit. We pray, O Lord, that thou wilt bring salvation to those who are unsaved, healing, Lord, to those who are sick and afflicted. We pray that thou wilt bring comfort and solace to those who are distressed. We pray that thou wilt make thyself very real to all those who listen now as we worship thee. We pray that thou wilt bless this vast and great assembly. Bless all those gathered here, that as we lift our hearts together in praise to thee, we may bring glory to thy name, advancement to thy cause, extension to thy kingdom. Bless the speaker. Bless every song, and may all be done to thy glory and in thy spirit of love. This we ask in Christ's name and for his holy sake. Amen. Let me through. 
That was 1L Williams Oliver from West Virginia. In our first years of broadcasting, 1L was our contralto soloist for our radio team. We're delighted to have her with us in this service. Indeed, this week has been one of blessed fellowship for Brother Lane and the staff. We have been privileged to visit with Forward and Faith sponsors and supporters from around the world. Brother and Sister Ellie Heil are here from Yokohama, Japan, where a potential audience of 23 million are exposed to the gospel through the medium of radio. Brother Summers is here from Jamaica, Brother Justice from Trinidad, Brother Hughes from Alaska, Brother McCall and Brother Beatty from Central and South America, along with Brother Cersei from Panama, and also Antonio Collazo, radio minister for our Spanish version, Adelante in La Fe. The theme of this biennial conclave is from the scriptural setting in Esther 4.14, for such a time. Without a doubt, God has called, commissioned, and anointed the church for just such a time. If you could be here, you would sense that there is no recanting or retreating, there is no passiveness, as to our responsibilities as Christians in this 20th century, and there is not in sight any compromise on the principle of holiness as a scriptural standard of living for God's people. Furthermore, as the oldest Pentecostal church in America, we accept the challenge of such a time in this dispensation of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Throughout the week, this vast audience has lifted their voices in praise unto God. And in this service, I want us all to stand and sing together as Brother Alford leads us in the song, Amazing Grace.
despair when he spoke, spoke to me there. And he told me that I could be free. Then he lived oh, and he oh, out of sin, just lurks there. When he reached down his hand for me, when I say. Minister G.W. Lane joins a chorus of ministers who in this assembly expound the scriptural text in Esther chapter 4, verse 14. For this occasion, Brother Lane has chosen the subject, the thrust you can trust for times like these. Brother Lane. Thank you, Brother Triplett. I'm very happy to invite our radio family into the service of this great General Assembly and to have you enjoy the spirit of this vast audience. You've heard them sing, and now I should like to share with you the central theme of this assembly for such a time. We're living in a time of high anticipation in various ways. The world leaders are trying to get or stay in the lead in space travel, and we have seen high accomplishments in this field of endeavor. Satellites were sent into space as the world stood in amazement. Mice and monkeys were next. Then the man from Russia orbited the Earth. We stood breathless with our first man, was thrust into space, and one after another they have left the Earth to encircle it in space. The race is on by the nations as they labor feverishly to do the next thing first. The most recent accomplishment was the rocket to the moon by our own scientists with hundreds of pictures being sent back by the cameras attached to the rocket. What excitement was experienced all over the world over this, the highest achievement. Pictures of the place uppermost in the masterminds of the world gave reason for their rejoicing. Closer and closer they're coming to their anticipated goal, a man on the moon. You can tell the limitation of their planning to be no further than something now seen. Having advanced pictures of it gives acceleration to their effort as step by step they see signs of approaching blast off of a man to the moon. This is exciting and it is an achievement toward which we work and watch. But as thrilling as it is, we Christians have something more in mind than a trip to the moon. We have been reading the book of Revelation for a number of years that gives specific data on space travel that does not include the moon as a landing place nor even a stop over on the way. This planning is designed to go far above the starry sky. This book has given complete coverage of a space trip separate and apart from these presently planned by the scientists and progress is being made day by day toward this takeoff. This makes our time one such as the world has never known, and it is great to live in such a time as this. This which I have related is a brief preview of the final and great trip of which I will speak further in this message. I must tell you that God's plan of salvation is in three stages, and these scriptural stages coincide with the orbital steps in rocketry. This being true, I should like to show you the three stages thrust that places you into a position out of this world. When the countdown is on, the tracking stations and possible landing locations are asked about the winds and the waves and if elements are favorable for any eventuality. When all conditions are right, 
the man in the nose cone gives his consent to go, without which nothing would happen. What a parallel with spiritual readiness. The atmosphere in all conditions are proper, and the Lord said, all things are ready. Your consent is the only requirement for a personal send-off. At countdown zero, the first thrust is made, which is the big lift. It takes you out of this world. Against all the Earth's pull, it takes you on. Earth's gravitation is powerless to hold against this thrust. This actually separates you from the world. And if this is not your experience, you haven't had the first thrust. This first thrust represents the new birth, which is the difference between light and darkness, life and death, heaven and hell. It is the liberty and freedom from the things that hold you captive. It was about a year ago in a service in Tennessee. Several people had come to the altar and had been helped, but a middle-aged man continued to tarry. I asked the pastor if the man was satisfied, and he said, Brother Lane, he is an alcoholic. A compassion gripped my heart. And kneeling by him, I said, Sir, this is your time to receive help. And when we had prayed together and commanded this evil spirit of alcoholism to go, this man jumped to his feet and joyfully exclaimed, He's gone! He's gone! This, my friend, is the big lift. This is the thrust out of this world. It means you really begin to live. The first thrust is designed by the Lord with a purpose to send you towards subsequent experiences and not the end of all grace. This being true, you must not become too relaxed in your peace. To level off and cease to climb, you will forfeit your second thrust, which does not come until you reach the height of the first. Your justification must be full and complete, and then you become eligible for the next benefit of grace. Whatever thrill was was yours in the first moments of your contact with God must remain and grow more blessed as you go toward the heights. The second stage thrust at the peak of the first is shown in fashion and design in Christ's prayer recorded in St. John's 17th chapter. He said, Father, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Jesus recognized the first thrust they had received by this statement and continued to pray that they might have my joy fulfilled within themselves and that they they might be one even as you and I are one. For this cause I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. To provide for this second stage thrust, Jesus prayed and died as is stated in Hebrews 13, 12. Wherefore Jesus, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood suffered without the gate. Let us go forth therefore without the camp bearing his reproach. The great apostle Paul greeted the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified. For the design to be carried out, the effects of this thrust would have to be a oneness with Christian brethren and great joy within the heart. A great example is shown of this answered prayer in Bethany as Jesus was lifted out of the disciples' view and as they returned to Jerusalem. From a natural standpoint, they would have been extremely sad, but having this blessing imparted to them, they were extremely glad. They returned to Jerusalem with great joy. God had fixed it in this second stage thrust so that you can be sad on the outside but happy on the inside. A smile can burst through the, the tears that might be caused by outside sorrows. This, my friend, will hold us together while the world falls apart. The same rule applies to this stage as the first. You can't level off and go on at the same time. We must, must never become complacent and think we have arrived. When we reach the height of the second thrust, we will have enough joy to glorify God and give audible praise to his worthy name as we journey to a place above street level with the purpose of tarrying for the endowment of power for our service. The beauty of this thrust is that it takes you high above the fancies of the world and renders them small in appearance. 
If you stand at street level against the Empire State Building in New York City, you're blinded by its vastness in size. But if you go to the top of that same building and look down, everything street level appears very insignificant. This attitude will be yours before you receive the third thrust. The early church stayed in the upper room from uh, continually praising and blessing God until the day of Pentecost and Jesus entered the throne room of God. Jesus was seated at the right hand of the Father and now the Christians sat in the upper room. Jesus asked the Father to send the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Ghost, to anoint those waiting people. The Holy Ghost came as a rushing, mighty wind and filled the whole house and filled all the people. This experience was accompanied by speaking in tongues, understood by the multitudes of people who came to see this great occurrence being noised abroad. This, my friend, was the third thrust for the early church known as the early rain. Thank God it did not stop there. The arrangement of God included an outpouring for these last days known as the latter rain. This third thrust applies to the rocket, sends it into orbit where it is taken over by another force and it is hurled around the earth 18,000 miles an hour. I should also like to remind you that in orbit you are weightless and burdens seem light. Things seem at times to float for you like the astronaut's camera that floated up from the floor and the little washer that you had to swat away like a fly. A scriptural sensation is enjoyed today by the third thrust just as on the day of Pentecost. Oh yes, I know there are many sunsets when you're in orbit. Experienced in these orbits, you will see the sunsets. But praise God, right after the sunset comes another sunrise. I like the fact also that you are for the most part the sole judge of your time to stay in this realm of ecstasy. No one can pull you out of this spiritual orbit. Not persecution at home, on the job, at school, not by principalities or powers. You, my friend, will remain in spiritual orbit until you slow down. This is the only way to come down. The only way to slow down is to fire your own retro rockets, and this you will have to do. It is up to you to decide your own spiritual status, even at such a time as this. These three stages of spiritual thrust prepare us for the next great event for which we now earnestly await. The time in which you and I are privileged to live is such a time as no other generation has ever known. It is the time into which is being poured the actualities of yesterday's prophecies, the prophecies of which our day is, is spoken of in our day, is the day of preparation. No such day has ever been in which a nation was born in a day as was Israel. No other day has witnessed the pillars of smoke towering six miles high as a result of atomic blast. No other day saw such broadening of highways. No other day has experienced such international wranglings and warfare. National peril was never so pronounced. No other day gave evidence of such moral declension so as to produce addiction to drugs and drink to, point of, to a point of self-destruction. Actually, death is preferred to life in some areas to such an extent that anti-suicide clubs have been formed to prevent them from ending their lives among high school students who should be happy. Misfit marriages, filled divorce courts, and crowded institutions, medical, mental, and for the maladjusted, the religious world also is on stage acting out the prophecies for this day. Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Refusal of sound doctrine and turning to fables by many. Church mergers without consideration for biblical doctrine. Nations are forming a federation whose kings or heads will give their power to the Antichrist. This is now existent, my friend, which tells us that the Antichrist will soon come on the scene. But be it known unto all men that the Antichrist cannot come until Jesus Christ has appeared and called his church away. Recently, it was said by an attorney 
as he was in a meeting considering ecumenicity. He said some of the small church groups are going to have to be put out of the way before the ecumenical movement can fully be effective. When I heard them say this, I said back to him in my own mind, you don't have to push us, sir. We're going anyhow, and we may go sooner than you think. We'll not be here to give you any trouble. When spiritual apostasy is complete and kings bow to the Antichrist, we will not be here to bother you. Now back to this space trip being arranged for God's people. The church is contemporary in its thinking and planning. Do not sell the church short in this day of space travel. When the rocket is on the launching pad and the power is applied, you see smoke from all sides. The rocket at that time is called a hot bird. In this light, I should like to tell you the church stands as it were on the launching pad. The power is on and the church today is a hot bird. And it's set for the deliverance of God's people from all adverse conditions. There is going to be a launching of millions, not to the moon, not to Mars, but to the marriage supper of the Lord Jesus Christ. This one will not be by thrust this time, but by the powerful pull from the Lord himself as he comes for his church. The best the scientists have done or planned to do is to send one or a few into space, but the church is standing ready at such a time as this to present overcoming Christians to the Lord by the millions in a moment. Praise God. For such a time as this, we must look away from our troubles to this wonderful trip. Look away from the cares of life and know that the Lord Jesus Christ cares for you. Are you ready for this trip? Wherever you are, are you watching? Are you waiting anxiously? If so, the Lord's looking at you. He's going to say, come away, my dove, my fair one. You've suffered enough. You've gone through these times of sorrow and heartaches and now come up higher. If you're not ready, wherever you are, would you bow your heads and let us pray. I thank you, O Heavenly Father, for the people who have heard me at this hour. I thank you for your wonderful spirit and power we have felt in this service among these thousands of people. And I believe those people out in Radio Land have felt thy wonderful spirit wherever they are. Almighty God, I pray that you bring the lost one home, bring backsliders in. I pray that you solve the problems of those people who are confused and answer their questions. Bless, I pray, our nation and all the nations. Bless the world with peace and give a revival, I pray, in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. has come to you from the General Assembly of the Church of God in Dallas, Texas.